Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. This is the first webinar in a weekly series of technical and business webinars covering Azure AI and OpenAI topics, along with essential product information. We want to empower you all to leverage in-depth knowledge and skills for rapid large language model solution development in your organizations. So just as a reminder, some of the topics that are covered in today's session will be at level 100. However, there is going to be deeper dives in the upcoming session, so please stay tuned. Let's get started. So in today's agenda, we have a couple of things. We're going to be covering a brief intro into generative AI, the Azure AI portfolio, how to get access to Azure OpenAI, all the available models today, some high level concepts, some features in Azure OpenAI, along with some success stories. So let's start off with learning a bit about the brief history of artificial intelligence. AI has a long and storied history that spans many decades. Some of the earliest work in AI was done in the 1950s and 1960s when researchers began to explore the possibility of creating machines that could think like humans. Then in 1990s and 2000s, the AI research continued to evolve and a lot of new subfields began to emerge. One of these was machine learning which focuses on creating algorithms that allow computers to learn from data without being explicitly programmed. And another was neural networks, which are the mathematical models inspired by the structure and the function of the human brain. So now recently, generative models like GPT-3 and DALI have risen and continue to advance in the field of AI. These models are special because they're able to generate new examples that are similar to examples from a given data set. It's being used in diverse fields like natural language processing, computer vision, speech recognition, and many more. So overall, AI has come a long way since its inception in the 1950s, and it continues to evolve and improve at a rapid pace today. So there exists a partnership between Microsoft and OpenAI, which aims to accelerate the development and the use of advanced AI technologies with the focus on making AI more accessible to developers and organizations in order to bring the benefits of AI to more people. This page is to show you where Azure OpenAI belongs within the AI stack. So as you go down, the complexity increases. To start off, AI is built into many applications already, like you'll see in Microsoft 365, Microsoft Dynamics 365. Then we have the state-of-the-art apps, and generative AI is integrated into a suite of services like Power BI and Power Apps, Power Automate, and even Power Virtual Agents. Moving forward, we have the productivity suit, which has low and no code solutions. So you'll see that a lot of these services are tightly integrated with the Azure OpenAI service. So you have things like document intelligence and cognitive search. So document intelligence is a set of AI models whose job is to look at a form and extract key value pairs. It also has models that help you recognize different types of forms. Then Video Indexer uses a collection of models to extract insights from videos. So you can extract insights from a particular timestamp or figure out who's speaking. Lots of different features there. Then you have running on the state-of-the-art customizable AI models. So this includes our vision, speech, language, decision, and of course, the one we're gonna be talking about in more detail, Azure OpenAI. And all of these run on a massive scale, the Azure Machine Learning Platform. 
So let's get started by diving deeper into the Azure OpenAI service and specifically the types of models and their capabilities. So you have the GPT-4 model, the GPT-4 Turbo, which is new, GPT-3.5 Turbo, Turbo Instruct, and then GPT-4 for Vision, also new, and the DALI model. And not included here, we also have the Whisper model and the Embedding model. So the DALI-3 and Whisper model are currently in preview, and GPT-4 Turbo offers lower pricing, extended prompt length, and structured JSON formatting with improved efficiency and control. We'll go through these text models in a little bit more detail, but DALI-3 helps generate images based on natural language, and Whisper can help you transcribe and translate speech to text. So all of these are deployed in your Azure subscription, they're secured by you, and they're tied to your data sets and applications. Built-in responsible AI is also present to detect and mitigate harmful use. And then you have enterprise-grade security with role-based access, control, and private networks. All right, so going into these a little bit deeper, the GPT-3.5 models can understand and generate natural language or code. The most capable of these of this family of models is the GPT-3.5 Turbo, which has been optimized for chat and works well for both the chat and traditional completion tasks as well. The GPT-3.5 Turbo Instruct has similar capabilities to the Text DaVinci version 3 model. And the key difference between the GPT-35 Turbo and the Turbo Instruct is that Turbo Instruct uses the completions API instead of the chat completions. Now, it's important to see that GPT-4 and another version of GPT-4, the 32K, is now available for all Azure AI, Azure OpenAI service customers. So customers no longer need to request access to use GPT-4 and GPT-4 32K. GPT-4 can help you solve different difficult problems with greater accuracy than any of OpenAI's previous models. It can do everything that the GPT-3.5 model can do, so it could do chat and traditional completions tasks. Now, these models have different costs and performances, so you should always test the models and their versions out depending on your use case. Okay, so let's take some time to understand the GPT-3.5 model format. So one thing to note is that if the model doesn't know something, it will fabricate a response which is not factual. And so grounding the model is the best way to battle this. So you can ground through the system message. And how do you do that? Where, well, here's where you can provide a brief description of the assistant. You can give the assistant some instructions and tell it what to do and what not to do. And you can provide any additional data or information to ground it. Then it's followed by some user and assistant messages. So here on the right, you see an example. Uh, we have our system message where I'm saying you, uh, you are an Xbox customer support agent and your primary goal is to help users with issues they're experiencing with their Xbox devices. I'm giving it some personality, right? I'm saying you're friendly and concise. And then I follow with a user, uh, a, a couple of examples, right? So I'm saying the user is asking, why won't my Xbox turn on? The assistant responds and says, there could be a few reasons why your Xbox isn't turning on. And then I'm prompting the assistant to respond by stopping at another user query, where I'm saying I confirm the power cord is plugged in, but it's still not working. So that is the overall format of the GPT-3.5 models. So with generative AI, we truly have a natural way to interact with applications. Language has been the mode of input. And now we're adding a new chapter to Gen AI with these multimodal capabilities with the video and images. So this is in public preview. 
And when integrated with the Azure AI Vision, you can use images or videos along with text for generating text output. And there's a numerous amount of things you can do, you can see, so you can use object detection, you can understand and make inferences through video analysis, video Q&A from visual inputs and associated text-based prompt instructions. So when combined with Azure AI Search, it really transforms the way you retrieve information. So a couple of things you can use, uh, you can do when you're using this GPT-4 vision model. So you can generate detailed captions, provide contextual descriptions, and do visual question answering. So the DALI-3 model, this is an image generation model that allows you to generate images from text prompts. You can see a couple of examples here. And these are just some use cases for DALI-3. So you can use it for product visualization, uh, a lot in the education sector, gaming sector, fashion design, logo branding, lots of ideas there. And then with the Whisper model, so this is the latest in the state of the art from OpenAI and is incredibly powerful. You can achieve human level perfection in text generation. You can have nuanced instructions and it essentially helps you transcribe and translate your audio. All right, so Azure OpenAI is powered by a diverse set of models with different capabilities and price points, like I mentioned. So the model availability varies by region. Here is a list of regions where Azure OpenAI can currently be provisioned. So some recently available regions include Canada East, East US 2, Japan East, and North Central US regions. But of course, there's a lot more. And you can check the models page for the latest information about model availability in each region. You want to pay close attention to this when you're creating your Azure OpenAI resource and make sure that you create it in the regions that the service is available in. All right, so we have the Azure AI Studio, which we'll take a look at in depth in the next few slides. But essentially, some of the things you can do on it are build and train your own models. You can do some vector indexing. You can try out the pattern of retrieval augmented generation, work with prompt flow, and even test out AI safety. There is a new feature as well. It's called add your own data. So here it's really nice because you can test out the RAG pattern and you can upload your own documents and then query on top of them. All right, so let's jump into a demo about how to get access to Azure OpenAI and what happens once you receive access. All right, so this is the page to come to when you are applying for the Azure OpenAI service. If I go down, I will see the link to do so. Right here, how do I get access to Azure OpenAI AI? And you can click on this and it'll take you to this form, which looks something like this. And then you can fill out all of your details, particularly the subscription that you want Azure OpenAI access on. And a couple more in details. And then you should be able to receive a response in a few days. Once you do, uh, then logging into your Azure portal, you'll be able to see the Azure OpenAI icon. And so it'll look something like this. So I have my Azure OpenAI icon right here. And then clicking on that, I will be able to create an Azure OpenAI resource. Here is my Azure OpenAI resource that I've already created. I can see that I have access to my keys and endpoint, and I have access to the Azure OpenAI Studio. So let's go and take a look at that. Perfect. So 
this is the Azure Open AI Studio and a couple of things here. So I will be able to create models over here so I can create new deployments. You can see that I have the GPT-35 Turbo 16K version deployed along with our embedding model deployed as well. And then over here, I can see the models that I have access to as a part of the subscription. So I can see all the different versions here. Awesome, so this is how you can apply for Azure OpenAI Access and then what to do after. Okay, so I wanna start by going through some Azure OpenAI fundamental concepts now. And again, remember that I'll go through these in a high level, but in the upcoming sessions, we'll go through these in more detail. So the first one is regarding prompt engineering. So let's learn about prompt engineering, right? The definition is that it's a concept in natural language processing that involves embedding descriptions of tasks in input to prompt the model to output the desired results. So what does that look like? Well, the prompt typically includes problem descriptions, instructions on how to solve the problem, and examples of correct problem and solution pairs. So you can have zero shot, one shot, or a few shot, right? And so in zero shot, the model predicts the answer given only a natural language description of the task. Then in one shot, in addition to the task description, the model is seeing a single example of the task. And then we have few shot, where in addition to the task description, the model sees a few examples of the task. So it's learning from those examples. And then of course, there's also custom tuning. All right, so we have tokens and I'll go through some examples and then we'll do a demo on how a tokenizer works. So let's understand tokens. Tokens are just a representation of how the Azure OpenAI models process text. So think of them as words or just chunks of characters. You can think of tokens as pieces of words used for natural language processing. And for English text, one token is approximately four characters or 0.75 words. So in the examples that you see here on the top left, there is a sentence, I have an orange cat named Butterscotch, and you can see how it's broken down into its respective tokens. Then these GPT models, given a context window of a certain amount of tokens, let's say it's 4K tokens, they're pushed into a model which will generate the next likely token. And so that's what's being shown in this example here, right? Um, I'm saying horses are my favorite and having it predict the next likely token. The total number of tokens processed for a request really depends on many things. It depends on the length of your input, output, and request parameters. You can see that some parameters here. So temperature is one. Um, and so, Temperature is really a parameter that controls the creativity or randomness of the text generated by OpenAI. So the lower the temperature, like zero, means that the model is going to give you more focused responses. And then the higher the temperature means that the answers will be more diverse. So you can see an example of that here. All right, so I just wanted to show you how a piece of text might be tokenized. And so I'll put in some examples here for us to see. This is a really neat tool. Um, I'd highly recommend going to platform.openai.com slash tokenizer to practice some sentences. So I'll say something like, this is the best OpenAI overview you've ever seen. And so you'll see that in a lot of cases that each word is its own token. So we can see the total number of tokens here. But if I put something like, I want to show you this example so you can understand the process 
of tokenization. So you'll see that for the most part, each word is its own token, but the word tokenization is further chunked up into uh, token and ization. So this would be a great tool to test out. Okay, let's talk quota. So there's two rate limiting strategies that are important to know. One is TPM, tokens per minute, and the other is RPM, which is rate per minute. Token per minute is how throughput is expressed. And so why do we use TPM? Well, each model in Azure OpenAI is going to use a different number of GPUs to process tokens. So to create a standard metric across all models, we use TPM to gauge the amount of capacity needed to support any given use case for any given GPT model. Now, RPM, rate per minute, is the number of API calls made that the Azure OpenAI service within one minute. There's a ratio with TPM and RPM, and you can see that formula here on the right-hand side. So essentially, the takeaway is that there is six RPM per 1,000 TPM. So here's a slide about understanding quota and how it works. So when you onboard a subscription to Azure OpenAI, you receive a default quota for the available models for a region. Then as you create deployments or your models, the TPM is assigned to each model until you reach the quota limit. You will see also that when you deploy the models and assign TPM, that there's a direct relationship between the tokens per minute and the API calls per minute. Now at this point, you can only create new deployments of that model by reducing the TPM assigned to other deployments of the same model. In a way, you're freeing some of that TPM. Or the other option is that you can request for model, model quota increase and go through the approval process in a designated region. So this is a view of what quota allocations look like across deployments in a given region. You can see the quota name right here, which shows that there is one quota value per region for each model type. You can see the deployments where you, when you expand the quota name. So these deployments are divided by model class. And then you have the usage and limit, and you can see how much quota is being used by the deployments and the total quota that is approved for the subscription and region. You see a lot of these models uh, that you have have around 240,000 TPM of quota. And then finally on the right is a link to the form where a request to increase quota can be submitted, like I mentioned before. So Azure OpenAI provides a REST API that allows you to leverage large scale generative AI models. And like we talked about before, there are limits and default quotas for Azure OpenAI. So each large language model will have a separate quota and you can find out what those numbers are for any given model. All right, so next concept is chunking. So we've talked about tokens. Now, um, depending on the model you're using, there is unfortunately a maximum input size of tokens that is allowed. For example, the GPT-35 Turbo model supports a maximum of around 4,096 input tokens. So when you have large documents as your source data, which happens to be most of the time, you must go through this chunking technique so that the token limit is not exceeded. Chunking essentially means that you're splitting that large document into smaller and smaller chunks. There are various techniques to do so. Uh, some include fixed size chunks, variable size chunks, and content overlap. And these are very use case dependent, so you have to test some of them out. Okay, so embeddings. 
So from the last concept, we have these broken up chunks of a document. But how do we measure similarity between the chunks? Embeddings are a special format of data representation that can be helpful here. They are a vector of floating point numbers. So let me give you an example. Let's say we are working with strings. And I have three pieces of, of text, right? Three strings. And I want to figure out which ones are the most similar. So the three pieces of text are, one, my table is brown. Two, my chair is black. And three, I have to go to the farmer's market this Sunday. So after I create these embeddings, I would find that the first two sentences are closer together and would have a vector representation that is also similar. You can use embeddings for things like search, for clustering, recommendations, classification, and more. Here is another example of text along with their respective vector representations. All right, so let's jump into another demo now on some of the Azure OpenAI Studio features along with how we can see this in action through a Python SDK. Okay, last but not least, I wanted to show you the Studio and some of its features. So here you can see you have access to the chat playground, the completions playground. You can even test out Dolly or bring your own data as a couple of them. So I wanna play with the chat playground and I'll show you what that looks like. So once again, you've created your Azure OpenAI resource, then you have access to the Azure OpenAI Studio and I come over here. So in my system message, um, which is again going to help your model from hallucinating. So this is where you would put in all of that information. And then you can chat with your assistant over here. And this is again, I'm specifying which model I want to use. So for this example, I'm using the GPT-35 Turbo 16K model. You can experiment with some parameters here. So like I said, the the higher the number for the temperature, the more creative your response. And you either want to work with temperature or top P. So for example, right now I'm gonna switch it all the way to zero. And then I think I'll leave everything else as default. Okay. And again, you can keep track of which messages to include. So there's a little description here. It basically gives the model context for any new user queries. All right, so let's do a little test, right? I wanna say, um, and I'm gonna copy my example that I have right here. So instead of just saying, I'm an AI assistant, I'm gonna say, I'm an, you are an AI assistant that helps people find information about the World Table Tennis Championship. If asked about anything else, say salsa. So I'm going to save these changes. And again, you know, you can always feel free. And there's a bunch of templates that you can play around with, but I'm just putting in my own. So I'm going to say that. And then let's ask a question, right? I want to say, who won? Here we go. Who won the first World Table Tennis Championship? So I'll hit enter. Okay, so we have a response. It says the first World Table Tennis Championship was held in 1926 and the winner was Ro Ro Roland Jacobi from Hungary. Okay, well now, what if we ask this question? Who won the World Table Tennis Championship for men's singles in 2023? Uh-oh, so it says... I'm sorry, but as an AI assistant, I don't have access to real-time information. Uh, this hasn't taken place yet. And for the most up to, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, uh-oh, this is a problem, right? It doesn't know anything. It doesn't know anything about the World Table Tennis Championship in, in 2023. So essentially what's in the prompt is gonna help us determine the next likely token. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to grab some information, right? We want to ground their model with our own data. So I just pulled up this article about the 2023 World uh, Table Tennis Championship that happened. So I'm going to grab some text from here. Let's just say I want to take it all the way till here. So I'm going to grab this text. And then I'm going to modify our system prompt and say, this is what you know. And then I'm going to say, paste all of that information that we got. OK, let's save those changes. OK, so now let's try again, right? Let's ask the same question, but this time our model has the ground data. All right, so you see that the answer has changed. Fang Zendong of the People's Republic of China won the men's singles crown at the World Table Tennis Champions. Awesome. So what was the change, right? Well, we gave we gave the model information. We grounded it with the information it needed in order to give us a accurate response. So now let's say I say um, something like, What should I put on my tacos? Also, and then let's try again. What kind of dance is the best dance? Salsa. So why is it saying that, right? Is we specified in our prompt, if asked about anything else, say salsa. So that's good. It's listening to the instructions that we gave it. Awesome. So this is how you can ground your model in the simplest way through the prompt, and then you can chat with your data. Now, the problem is that we have a token limit, so we can't always put in all the information that the model might need in the system message. And so that's when you can use things like the external knowledge base to store your data. Um, a feature that you can test out to understand this co concept is called Add Your Data. And so here's where you can add all of your data sources and then query on them. So they'll be stored in an external knowledge base, like a blob store in Azure. And then you can use cognitive search to go ahead and index all of that data. So we saw that you can access the Azure OpenAI service through the OpenAI Studio, but you can also access it through REST APIs and the Python SDK. So this quick example shows us how to use the chat completion API call with a Python SDK. Again, I've done the same thing here. I'm defining all of my variables um, and I've defined them in my config.json file. And then all I'm doing is I have this messages variable, um, which passes in an array of dictionaries with different roles in the conversation. And it's delineated by system, user, and assistant. So we talked about these briefly, but the system is the role that instructs or sets the behavior of the assistant. The user is the role that provides input for chat completions. And assistant, again, you know, is the one that provides responses to the system instructed user prompted input. So when we end at user, what I'm doing is I'm kind of triggering a response from the model. All right, so in this case, all I'm saying is does Azure OpenAI support customer managed keys? Give it an, an example answer where I say yes, customer managed keys are supported by Azure OpenAI. So now, um, I ask, do other Azure AI services support this too? And we can see the response over here at the bottom. Again, stop means that the API has returned a complete model output. And we can see the response in the content field over here given by the assistant. So that is a very simple example. And then you can also see the total number of tokens that were used. All right, so I want to take some time and go through some of the newer features like function calling and plugins. I'll play a video now that really helps us understand the capabilities of plugins.
Azure OpenAI service and ChatGPT can be used to increase productivity across so many use cases. And today I'm going to show you just one of those examples. Let's imagine you are a grocery chain and you have a vision to create an experience better than a phone tree and one that can engage conversationally with customers in a personal way and tailored to their needs. Notice as I'm asking questions in the chat, it is responding in a very friendly and personal manner. As I ask generic questions, it infuses company knowledge into the actual response. When I ask about food products, you can see on the right, the company context changes based upon my question so that it can incorporate this knowledge into its response. In the next question, I'm asking about how soon it can deliver things to me. Since it knows my location based upon the current customer context, it even includes this information in the response. Notice how it says I live in the Pacific time zone so it can deliver in the same day with some nice emojis to boot. Let's take a look at how this is actually done. Here you can see the prompt template, which has some gaps that we can use to fill in the customer and company context. Again, the purpose is to build the best prompt to generate the best response given your company and your customer context. Notice the generated prompt has the context, the documentation that was retrieved based upon the question, as well as the conversation so that we can send this all to the API endpoint. Now, again, this isn't a complicated process. It's just a single call to the API. And if you want to see what we're sending to the service, it's literally just the crafted prompt, the temperature, which controls the level of randomness or creativity in the generated response, how many responses to create, size, and whether to stream the response or not. That's it. This, of course, is just one example of how you can use technology like ChatGPT. It can be used across so many use cases, like to generate a personalized experience on your website or to summarize reports that would take an analyst days to read or to mine or to mine insights from thousands of product reviews. We can't wait to see the next generation of applications our customers build with generative models. Awesome. So that was great to see some of the capabilities. I'll go through some of them in a little bit more detail. So there is the built-in uh, OpenAI retrieval plugin, which enables Azure Cognitive Search to start, but then many more vector databases to follow. We have Azure Translator, which helps you get state-of-the-art translations. Incorporated Bing Search to get uh, recent information. There are structured data sources like Azure SQL and soon to come Cosmos DB. And all of this uses Azure Active Directory and managed identities to ensure that the apps you're building only have access to what they are authorized to read. And administrators of the Azure OpenAI resource can also limit what plugins are authorized for use in the resource. All right, so function calling is in preview. It, and so if one of, essentially what it does is if one or more functions are included in your request, the model will then determine if any of the functions should be called based on the context of the prompt. And we can go in to an example now to understand how this really works. Okay, so in this really quick example, we'll see how function calling helps to leverage the power of these GPT models in a more structured and controlled manner. So here we're using function calling to primarily produ provide product information for this fake company called Contosos, um, their internal application that supports the sales and customer care operations. So Contoso's product information is stored in an internal application that can be retrieved using APIs. So all I'm doing here is I'm initializing all of my Azure OpenAI environment variables that I've stored and defined in my config.json file. So I have my deployment name, which is the model I'm using, and my key and my endpoint along with the version. So you can see that here, I'm using GPT-35 Turbo, the 16K. Then as I go down, I'm gonna run this. So what I'm doing here is I can create these external function calls with function calling. So in this demo, my external call is going to be a simple Python function. 
And so the purpose of this is to return the Contoso product information. So you can see that this is the function I have defined, get product summary. And this is the argument that I'm passing through, product name. And then you can see the output there that I want it to pass out. All right, so going down, um, what I'm doing here is I'm defining the functions that I want to use within this functions um, array. So I, the only one I have is get product summary. Now, the important thing to note is I've set function call equal to auto, which means that the model is going to decide whether or not the function should be called. So I'm defining the functions in the function uh, functions parameter of my chat completion API call. And now I am ready to test it out. So I go down here, I have my system message and my user query. So I'm asking, um, the, the system message says, to get a summary of a Contoso product, call the get product summary function. And I'm passing in, what consumer products does Microsoft make? Let's see what it gives me as the response. All right, so it says something like Microsoft makes a variety of consumer products and it, it goes on to explain them. So in this one, it realizes that function calling really is not required. So, but it's still able to just generate an answer based on the model. Now in this one, if I run that, I'm asking, I wanna buy a Contoso laptop X, tell me more about it. So here it's it's doing well. It's able to recognize that it needs to call that particular function and it's classified the argument that it, it needs in order to give a response. So we can see that the, the argument for the product is Contoso laptop. So now if we go down, What we're doing here is we are um, checking if the model wants to call the function. We are uh, getting the arguments for that function. In, in that case, it was the Contoso laptop. And then we can see uh, that the final answer, once it's read in those arguments, is Contoso laptop X is a 20 inch laptop made with the best material and manufactured using the latest technology. So we see that it's incorporated that function call and given us a response based on that. Okay, so let's go through some of the data privacy and responsible AI topics. So when you work with the Azure OpenAI models, your data is your data. All the data that you use and generate is stored and encrypted at rest. These models are trained by OpenAI and not Microsoft, so the customer data is never shared to train new models. We believe that the development and deployment of AI must be guided by the creation of an ethical framework. And so in 2018, we set our view that there should be six core principles that should guide the work around AI. And you can see those on the left here. So privacy and security, inclusiveness, accountability, transparency, fairness, and reliability and safety. But it's not enough to define these principles. We need to operationalize them at scale as well. So there's four key areas that we focused on to put these principles into action. First, you need governance. Second, you need the rules to standardize AI requirements. Third, you need training and best practices. And fourth, you need the tools for implementation. We've developed an integrated responsible AI system that uses an ensemble of models to detect problematic content like hate, sexual, violence, and PII. These models can be used synchronously to improve the quality of the outputs and give customers control over the type and tone of the content in their application. They can also be used to identify potential instances of abuse and alert customers of those concerns. So 
Introducing Azure AI Content Safety, which is a new set of APIs that can help moderate text and images across multiple severities, languages, and categories. It can also be integrated into your applications through a REST API or through an SDK. And then content filtering, this is an additional layer of monitoring added on top of the models and does not save your data. It just provides a safety layer between AI and the end user to prevent responses, which might not be deemed suitable. Okay, so jumping into pricing. Azure OpenAI is a pay-as-you-go consumption model. So per unit price depends on the type and size of the model you choose, along with the number of tokens being used in the prompt and the response. If you check out the pricing details page, you will see information about our language models. So the GPT-35 Turbo, uh, all the different versions of 4K, 16K, and then also GPT-4 models, 8K, 32K. And then finally for our image model, Dolly and embedding model and Whisper. In September, we announced the Copilot to Copyright Commitment, which is a new benefit to defend all commercial customers from copyright claims relating to their use of Microsoft Copilot products. So during our Ignite conference recently, we announced that we're broadening this commitment to include the Azure OpenAI service. So it's going to be called the Customer Copyright Commitment, and it'll help customers as you look to accelerate the external use of generative AI. You'll need to implement technical measures to mitigate the risk of infringing output, but Microsoft is pleased to share that we're publishing a lot of new documentation to help you implement these measures and build with confidence. So let's go through some examples of architecture diagrams to really see Azure OpenAI in action. So we have this example uh, with, about document processing and summarization. So the Azure Document Intelligence tool that we see on the left, this is going to help crack all of the documents that you pass through to read, let's say it's handwriting or text or tables and process the language to extract the right entities. Then if you throw that into Azure Cognitive Search, it's going to help you index the documents to make them searchable. Then the Azure OpenAI service provides a queryable interface to generate natural language summaries of the documents indexed by Azure Cognitive Search. Cosmos DB is going to help store the documents, document the text uh, and the outputs of OpenAI in a dynamically scalable and globally reliable database. These results and output are then hosted on a web app, which is external, and then on to Power BI internally. Function apps are utilized to call various APIs in a serverless manner to improve responsiveness and reduce costs. Okay, so this is the most common pattern that we've seen. It's called Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. You can actually query your data and have the natural language experience. So it's a chatbot experience. And what you're doing is you're separating the large language model from the external knowledge base. And all of this is coordinated by an orchestrator that is mediating the interaction between the two components and the rest of the app experience. Now the external knowledge base, all it does is it allows you to bring your own data. Awesome. So those are two examples that I wanted to show you. And then I wanted to move into some of our success stories to really understand how Azure OpenAI is being used in enterprise scenarios. So first one is CarMax. CarMax is a leading used car retailer. 
And to make their car buying experience easier for customers, they have used Azure OpenAI to create text summaries for its car research pages. They've also created review summaries for customers to see what their peers are saying about a particular car. Then we have Take Blip, which is a multi-channel multi platform provider that helps brands communicate with their customers using an AI-first approach. The platform uses Microsoft Azure OpenAI service along with cognitive services to store and analyze customer brand interactions in a single place, unifying the entire customer journey from marketing to support. By using AI, Take Blip helps, take, helps brands analyze the data and predict the best next interaction with each individual improving the customer experience and accelerating clients' product roadmaps. The platform also uses Azure infrastructure services to achieve greater stability, scalability, and security. And by adopting an AI-first approach, brands can expect to see increasing conversion rates for sales and service, and this should lead e even more customers to engage with the brands. Take Blip is taking a leading edge approach to AI that makes it future ready and gives it a competitive edge in the marketplace for customer experience technology. Okay, we have last but not least Trellent, which is within the professional services industry and has been working on cutting edge AI algorithms to provide intelligent source code documentation for its clients. It uses the OpenAI Codex model for doc string generation. And Azure OpenAI has helped them improve their response time with the use of distributed regions having global coverage. And the switch from OpenAI to Azure OpenAI helped them gain the benefits of comprehensive security and regulatory compliance. Without having to build their own security and compliance features, Trellent engineers are free to dedicate their time to the company's core innovation, which is the prompts and the controls that shape the doc strings generated by the codex model. So hopefully this gives you a good view of how Azure OpenAI is being used. Thank you so much for all your time today, listening to all of the concepts covered by this overview. Again, stay tuned as there's so much valuable information coming your way in these weekly webinars. Thank you.